It was supposed to have been a memorable day, and indeed it was, but for all the wrong reasons. This was supposed to be Jesus' homecoming. Just a year and a half earlier, at age 30, Jesus had left his tiny backwoods village of Nazareth and had gone on to the bright lights and big cities of southern Judea, beginning his public ministry there. Now that, humanly speaking, Jesus had made a name for himself, Jesus decided to set his sights back closer to home. For the next year and a half, Jesus would make the port city of Capernaum along the Sea of Galilee his home base for ministry. It was there in the synagogue that Jesus had preached and had healed the demon-possessed man. It was there that Jesus had raised Jairus' daughter from the dead and performed a great many miracles. And it was from there that Jesus would preach and heal throughout the entire region. Eventually, Jesus would remember his roots. Eventually, Jesus' travels would take him back to his tiny town of Nazareth. Eventually, Jesus would remember Mama. One day, he did. How the people of the town thronged to see him. Here was a man, a carpenter's son, who had made a name for himself, becoming a self-taught rabbi. So comes Saturday, it would only make sense that Jesus would preach in the same synagogue he grew up in. The place was packed that Sabbath. Everybody came to listen to him. The elders began the service with the singing of the psalms, the responsive liturgy, the customary prayers, and then came time for the sermon. Jesus was up. He asked for the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and unrolled it to chapter 61 and began to read, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Luke tells us that he used Psalm, uh, Isaiah 61 as the basis for his sermon. And in the rest of the sermon, he proceeded to explain to him that he was the fulfillment of that prophecy from 600 years ago. That he's not just some self-taught rabbi. He is the very Messiah the people had been longing and waiting for. And the people were amazed at his message. They heard, they never heard anyone preach like this before. What wisdom! How he could quote the scriptures and make it so easy for even the simplest of people to understand. What authority! Oftentimes the rabbis would quote this old rabbi or that old rabbi or both of them and they would have contradictory statements and then he would leave it up, they would leave it up to the people to make the decision which rabbi they would agree with and which one they would disagree with. No, no, no. Nothing like that when it came to Jesus. He spoke the facts as they were, for this is most certainly true. But then the people got to thinking, isn't this Jesus the same person who as a boy used to run around the village playing Romans and barbarians with my son? Isn't this the same person who as a teenager helped his father fix my plow? Isn't this the same person who a couple of years ago built a coffee table for me? We know his parents. We know his siblings. We know him. How can this son of a commoner, Mary, be the branch of David's royal stem? How can this lowly carpenter's son be the exalted king of kings? How can this son of man be the son of God? And as in the parable that Jesus had earlier preached where the farmer scatters seed along the path and the birds come and eat it all up, so had the ravens of human reason snatched that seed of faith from the people's hearts. 
Instead of fireworks in the sky, threatening fists were raised into the air. Instead of shouts of acclamation, there are catcalls to throw Jesus off a cliff. Instead of a long line of sick people waiting for Jesus to heal them, there were merely a handful. What was supposed to have been by human standards a complete and utter success had been, in fact, by those same standards, a complete and utter failure. Concerning the events in our text, Jesus made this remark, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own home. Fast forward to today. Each and every day, you and I are blessed with a great many witnessing opportunities if we open our eyes and truly see them. That coworker who is frustrated in selling his home or trying to buy a home. The classmate who seems to be growing more and more distant. The elderly neighbor who is having more and more health problems. And many times we do make the most of those witnessing opportunities assuring them from God's word that God is there for them, perhaps sharing with them a, a particular passage from Scripture that has helped you get through those tough times and can help them as well, using law and gospel when necessary, telling them about Jesus. And in many of those times, those words are well-received or at least thoughtfully pondered, and we praise God for that. But then there are times when God's word is not well received. At a, at a party, you try to explain to your teenage friend that underage drinking is wrong, and they throw that one time you had a beer back in your face. You marry a church-going spouse, and you grow in your faith and come to church regularly like your, your spouse does, and then you go to share with your non-church-going parents the message of salvation, that Jesus is the true reason for the season, that Jesus did, in fact, physically rise from the dead. And they sidestep the issue and make those remarks about your rebellious youth. You gently chide your coworker for spending too much time on the phone talking to friends or playing Candy Crush, and then they write off a list of things that you have done in your past that, in their minds, make you nothing more than a hypocrite. As the saying goes, familiarity breeds contempt. The message you shared was a good and powerful one, yet they rejected it because they are prejudiced against the messenger. How does that make you feel? when you're faced with such hostilities. If you're like me, you want to throw in the towel and never want to share the good news again for fear that you might face persecution or pain. So my friends, if you are feeling down and out when someone doesn't take your witness to heart, I've got some good for, news for you. You're not alone. Consider our text. What happened there? Jesus was rejected. Jesus, who always said the right thing at the right time. Jesus, who was always gracious and compassionate. Jesus, the best man to share God's word because he was and is the word, and his own hometown rejected him. If they would reject the master, how much more his students? Well, that is some encouragement, but may this additional good news quell your quitting spirit altogether so that you're once again motivated for ministry. My friends, Jesus had to be rejected so that you and I, so that we can be accepted. At the end of his public ministry on earth, Jesus was not only rejected by men, but God himself. The prophet Isaiah foretold of Jesus, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar for, with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, 
He was rejected. He was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. My friends, Christ's rejection means our salvation. God accepts us as his very own sons and daughters because he punished his very own son for our sins instead. As the evangelist John writes of Jesus, he came to that which was his own, and his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the power and right to become children of God. You and I, we've been born again of water and the word. Through our God-given faith, we believe in the name of Jesus that he is our personal Savior from all our spiritual enemies. Thus, we are children of God and heirs of eternal life. No one can take that away from us, my friends. Oh, yeah, they may take our life, goods, fame, child, and wife. Let these all be gone. They yet have nothing won. The kingdom is ours forever. There's also another point to be made here in this account, a point that is found in the very last sentence of this text. It reads, Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Jesus had suffered the greatest failure in his ministry up to that time. He could have quit. He could have gone on some long vacation to help him forget this fiasco. He could have rained fire and brimstone down from heaven on those unrepentant people. No, Jesus didn't do any of those things. Instead, he kept right on preaching and teaching, doing what he was called to do, healing and forgiving. Jesus was faithful to his task. As members of Christ's holy church, the Lord has assigned you and me with a great many noble tasks, particularly proclaiming the gospel. For a few of us, that means proclaiming the gospel in public fashion as in public ministry. But for most of us, that is done on the personal, private level. And in either case, as the hymn puts it, we all are called to service, to witness in God's name. Our ministries are different. Our purpose is the same, to touch the lives of others with God's surprising grace so every folk and nation may feel God's warm embrace. God calls us to be his witnesses, all of us. But our job is not to convert. That's the Holy Spirit's job. And yet the Holy Spirit works through his word which with, with which our Lord has entrusted us to share. We are merely God's mouthpieces, his ambassadors, his bringers of good tidings of great joy. Now how we share that good news depends on the gifts and talents with which the Lord has entrusted us. He does not call us to be the next Dave Ramsey of public preaching. He does not call us to be the next Dr. Phil of Christian counseling. He certainly does not call us to be the next Martha Stewart of Christian hospitality. And it sure can be tempting to throw in the towel and vow never to share Jesus again with others when our success doesn't level up to the same as that of those other people, humanly speaking. And yet God doesn't tell to us about success and failure. All he talks to us about is being faithful. God calls us to be faithful to who we are and with what we can do as Christ's 21st century disciples. And motivated by that sure and certain gospel message, we can in some way, shape, or form, as best suits us, as best as God has given us those gifts, we can tell the greatest story ever told. Now, we don't know how many people took Jesus' message to heart that day in Nazareth. It couldn't have been many. But the number wasn't exactly zero. 
For we know that James, the Lord's own brother, eventually came to faith after Jesus rose from the dead. Could the Holy Spirit have used Jesus' message that day to plant the seed of faith in his brother's stone-cold heart? We don't know for sure. We'll have to ask him that when we get to heaven. Likewise, we may never know what lasting our effect our proclaiming of the good news will have on others, even if they reject that message out of hand. The Holy Spirit may be using us simply to plant the seed. Later, he'll use another Christian to water it. But in either case, it is God, and God alone will make it grow. And that's what we can pray for as we handle failure with encouragement and with faithfulness. For God's kingdom will come. It has already come to us, and it will also come to others. And God's will be done that God wants all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And that will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God grant this for Jesus' sake. Amen.